welcome to The Lens at 177. On this show, we're speaking to a lady who's synonymous with the tourism industry in Fiji. She's been the face of tourism for many years, the head of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, Fantasha Lockington. Bula, Fantasha. Bula, and well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, those who are <coughs> readers of the Fiji Times would be very familiar with uh, Fantasha. She's a regular contributor to the paper. But uh, we'll start the show um, by speaking about the uh, post-COVID recovery and how swift it's been. If you could just share, share, just share some insights on the numbers, uh, arrivals. We just uh, noted in today's newspaper there's more than 90,000 yep. uh, last month. If you could just share a bit with us about that. <coughs> Thanks, Felix. So um, I've been sharing a lot through the Fiji Times um, Tourism Talano every Thursday right. what some of this recovery has looked like, and it has taken even the industry by surprise. We're generally a positive lot right. out there. You know, we always think, okay, it's you know, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Plus, we are and have always been very resilient. You cannot be an industry um, located in the South Pacific. Um, and exposed to things like climate change and the many tropical cyclones we have. Right. Um, not as regular now, but uh, flooding that happens, uh, especially around the Nandi area, without learning to be even more resilient as, as you uh, get older and older in the industry. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. So when COVID happened, uh, it was a completely different type of crisis, yes. uh, but it certainly was a crisis that we all learned very, very quickly from. I think the, the most terrible part of it was how long it actually lasted. Uh, right. Usually we've been able to get up the next day, clean up uh, and sort ourselves off. You kind of go, you know, dust yourself <laughs> off, let's get back, get back yes. into the business again. But COVID wasn't like that at all. And we were learning very, very quickly from what was happening all over the world and right. how people were dealing with it. And you would think uh, first world countries, uh, other developing countries would have known how better to deal with it, even though nobody had ever experienced it before. Yeah. But sometimes for us, it was quite an eye opener to see how people were actually dealing with it. Yes. Uh, and we learned very quickly from, from those, uh, both those mistakes um, and some of the better ways, uh, you know, better practices that were put in place. Having said that, when we finally reopened, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we realized now in hindsight that we probably reopened a lot more boldly than we had thought we were doing at the time. Right. But it was, uh, ba the reopening was based on we were ready, uh, we'd been preparing for months and months and months, and we were quite sure that everything that we had prepared for was going to take us uh, where we needed to go. Because yes. during COVID, there was a lot of research happening uh, in the in the background, trying to find out about what people were thinking about uh, during the times that they were locked up uh, around the world, people who would normally be traveling. Uh, and what we learned was that when you take away the freedom to travel from people, yes. it makes them want to travel even more. Like, right. you, you know, how yeah. dare you not let me, not let me get, get out of my house yeah. and out of my country. So people made uh, even more of an effort uh, to go online and not only just buy stuff that you would normally go and buy from a supermarket or you know the mall, but to look at how you were going to travel as well. So while Fiji was preparing for, yes, we were going to get people coming back, uh, and you know we had people from the public sector thinking no one was going to come. Yeah. No, 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 they're going to come from what we can see of the research. But when they did come, even we were surprised that that many people were coming. Yes. And the bookings not only just held steady, they just kept going and kept going. Right. Um, so we bounced back and bounced back uh, and then some. Plus, as the months have gone past and the years have turned you know, into, what is this? We opened in, it's, uh, it's going on to two years two now. Years now. Yeah. We've had other crises come out, we've got, um, uh, our key markets, Australia and New Zealand, you know, tightening up uh, monetary policy, yeah. um, uh, people's, uh, what do you call, loans, uh, and the interest rates are going up. And so people is, are saying, economists kept saying, oh, you know, we're going to have a little bit of a crunch there, we're going to have our visitor numbers drop down. But we still haven't seen that. In the two years since we've opened, right. Fiji has traditionally always had, pre-COVID, um, a, a peak season, shoulder season, then you have a drop. 
at least twice during the year. We have right. high seasons, low seasons, and what we call a shoulder, which is in between. Right. And we didn't have this. We just had high and shoulder, high and shoulder. Right. So we were thinking, okay, when is the low season coming? And it, <laughs> it still hasn't come. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's for a whole lot of reasons, not just people um, wanting to travel. O obviously, there was pent up demand that is often talked about. Yes. Um, but there's uh, a lot of really um, great packages out there for people around the world to have a look at, and not just for Fiji, it's, it's our competitors for, from Hawaii, the Southeast Asian countries of you know, uh, Indonesia, um, Bali, uh, and the like. Um, and, and all the way through to even Hawaii, if you mm. if you look at what the what's going on out there, people are really scrambling for uh, these wonderful specials and packages. But it's a little bit more than that, and I'd like to think it's because Fiji kind of capitalized when it reopened on refocusing, based on the research on what mm. people were looking for, yes. and what people were really looking for was time out. Uh, wellness suddenly became this whole new thing. People wanted to come for their right. physical as well as their mental, mental. health. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, so people mm. are looking for nature-based activities, um, you know, having a look at how they could be part of any conservation uh, protection efforts, um, whether it had anything to do with culture or right. um, helping out in communities. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there's this, um, there's this need to be able to give back, there's this need to do more in nature, uh, to do quieter things. Um, mm. And so there's a whole lot of new thinking in terms of what travel is meaning uh, to mm. people. Yeah. Safety, mm -hmm. health, wellness, yes. all these things mean, mean a little bit more. It's more what they call meaningful travel taking place right. now rather than just mm -hmm. let's take the kids on a break. Yeah. Fiji will always be, I think, um, uh, a de facto place for um, honeymoon, romance, as, yeah. as well as uh, family. Yes. But on top of all that, there's come this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, greater need. Uh, and, and we've seen that through the likes of the numbers of younger people coming. Okay. Uh, in the first uh, 12 to 18 months after reopening, um, the numbers showed us that people who would not traditionally have picked Fiji as a holiday right. destination were actually choosing to come. Initially, we put that down to, okay, because we were perceived as safer, we had really gone all out as an industry to make sure that safety was at the top of yes. the very, um, mm -hmm. uh, the top of the list of mm -hmm. how we were gonna make sure that uh, we made travel uh, uh, available to people. Right. We thought that was going to be um, the, what people were demanding and it was at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's more than that now. They've, yes. they've come in and s uh, seen people have, like in the first 12 months, in the first 12 months we saw a visitor numbers coming in, we could see the sentiments of you know, what people were thinking. They'd come in and book immediately for the next time they'd come in, ca uh, will right. kind of come back. So we're going, okay, we're on to a good thing here. Yes. Let's make sure that we keep that, um, that whole uh, reasoning for travel uh, going. Right. Uh, and that's making sure that we we were already doing it. I keep saying this, that we're already doing things like <coughs> the sustainable travel uh, yeah. type of option, where you go deeper into uh, you know, Fiji's interior to go and see um, how people live out there, right. but take advantage of the forests, you know, the, the trekking that you can do, um, whether you want to do a lot more stuff underwater or over water, um, yeah. and if you want to do more things with nature, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to always go and stay there, you can still stay in a traditional hotel yes. uh, like anybody else, but you can choose to go on these trips where you go out for a day or you go out for the, uh, a couple of days. Mm. So we've seen the interest in that and adventure travel really, really yeah, grow. Yeah. And we were doing that, but we weren't putting that up as, this is what Fiji is really about. Right. We we're always talking about the sun, sea, uh, sand, and our, our, our wonderful environment and also how, how wonderful our people are. That is still there, uh, right. that hasn't gone away, right. but we've layered it more with what else you can do. So if you're looking for, you know, um, making sure that you're getting enough bang out of your travel bug, then we are offering as many possible experiences and activities that you can look for. Okay. Uh, so trying to balance it out with what else you might not want to do uh, when you think of Fiji. Thank you for that. We'll be back with more on uh, our numbers with uh, Fantasia Lockington after this short break.
We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. We're having a very interesting discussion with uh, the head of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, Fantasia Lockington, about uh, tourism arrivals. And uh, you've given us a lot of um, positive information. But I think people want to know the actual numbers. What are the numbers? Uh, we know that last month was more than 90,000, but what are the actual numbers and the projections going forward? Let me, let me read from it so that I don't get it wrong. Right. Um, so for this month, we just, uh, for, sorry, for September last month, we brought in 90,439. Yes. Uh, and if you consider 2019, which is the year that we always um, benchmark against because it was the highest uh, tourism industry um, uh, performance. Right. The September in 2019, the arrivals was uh, 81,354. So definitely um, a, a huge increase in, in what we were doing as yes. opposed to post, post COVID. Right. The, the source markets are, are still pretty much the same, but the numbers from each of the source markets has, has increased. Australia, for instance, is up to 47%. New Zealand is 27%. Mm -hmm. And from USA, we bring in around 9%. Uh, and then the other countries are uh, slightly smaller figures. Right. But you put this up against the, um, the information that um, the national airline Fiji Airways is doing a lot more frequencies. They've got a bigger lift now with two bigger aircraft, yes. uh, the A350-900s, which is doing a wonderful job for them. Uh, so obviously your numbers uh, into those countries uh, in terms of your seat capacity is going to be lifted quite considerably. Right. I also wanted to mention that um, so, so far this year, mm -hmm. uh, there have been 689,142 arrivals, right. um, which is about 77% <coughs> of the total number of arrivals for 2019. Okay. So we're tracking, tracking really good. Uh, so far, the estimated earnings is uh, a little over 2 billion. Uh, if you consider in 2022, our total visitor arrivals was 636,000. Right. So we've already beaten that number just up to September. And we brought in around 2 billion in 2022. And in 2019, with 894,389 visitors, um, the industry brought in 3 billion. Right. So that's 689 visitor arrivals for this year is, um, that's pretty good. Yes. Good innings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you spoke about um, how the numbers are really good in terms of overseas visitors <coughs> coming in. But during um, COVID or just after COVID, the Love Your Locals uh, also was quite uh, yeah, successful. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. If you could speak a bit about that. Sure. Yeah. For, so for the, for we didn't have the whole industry open for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. Many operators needed a little bit more time, a little bit more support, uh, especially from um, banks, uh, you know, getting loans and uh, making sure that their product was um, right. refreshed uh, and ready for, for visitors. So those ones who were ready, uh, probably a little under 80% was, was ready when we reopened. Right. They opened, so um, because, bef and, and just before we opened, um, probably a lot less of those numbers were able to open and they opened to the local market, right. pro uh, got together and provided um, really, really good specials uh, yes. and packages for the locals. Um, I was sharing earlier uh, <coughs> about my sister mm. taking the opportunity to stay at uh, you know an overwater uh, bungalow yes. and absolutely enjoying it because she said I wouldn't have been able to afford the real price of it. Right. Um, and it was a great opportunity we probably couldn't have uh, offered as many restaurant or, or food uh, offerings because not many uh, restaurants could open within those hotels. Yes. But certainly uh, it was a time for the locals to take advantage of that. Right. Yeah. Well, some uh, locals uh, on social media <coughs> are not necessarily complaining, but just saying oh, that, they are. Uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, now that things are all open, 
they don't seem to have that opportunity anymore to, yes. you know. So, you know. It, it, is, it is unfortunate, but yes. it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast, if you will. Yes. So if you've got a product like, like a hotel and you've, your, your key market, yes. remember, is your overseas visitors, right. and they're filling it up, yes. and they're filling it up to such a capacity, um, we've had to deal with the outward movement of skilled labor outwards, yes. um, bringing new, uh, new uh, labor in, usually at the uh, mid to top levels. Um, but also having to constantly churn through uh, new lots of um, staff um, through throughout the system, so your 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 wage rates have gone up. The cost of business in Fiji has just increased. Right. Whether that's got to do initially with you know uh, the, the cost of freight and the cargo issues we were having initially, yes. or the the general cost of business, right. uh, and you don't have to be just a domestic. Um, you know, a person who owns a home who's finding uh, how expensive things are just to yeah. get over your bills and groceries. But that is uh, almost two or three times the, the case when it comes to uh, running operations in tourism. Right. So the cost of hotel rooms, the focus on overseas because that is your key target key markets target market. for, yeah. for filling up your hotels, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the these are going to be uh, those same markets that will be using the transportation between the hotels yes. and then going out to the experiences. Right. Whereas the, the locals, as much as we love them and we still love them, um, they won't be using transportation systems, so you'd have to put drivers off if right. you only relied on that. Uh, they tend to not use the restaurants or the bars uh, as right. often, uh, and they certainly do not uh, use up as much as the experiences or right. um, the activities that are out there, uh, which of course uh, have locals who run them, have locals who work in them, yes. and so this is how you make the economy go around. You've yeah. got to make sure that the money is getting passed around, right. so that we can pay eventually the tax man at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned the uh, you know the staff uh, turnover, staff turnover being an issue. What are the uh, other challenges facing the industry at the moment? So it's, it's a challenge not just being faced by tourism. Uh, I have no doubt it's being faced by everybody else. And yes. <coughs> excuse me, about what is this um, October? So early last year, um, we had brought this to the attention of the government to say, right. we believe it's going to be a bigger problem and it will continue to grow. And yes. it's something that you should be aware of. and be looking at what are the possible solutions to this. Mm -hmm. You can't stop people from going overseas. This, yes. is, uh, this is the kind of labor movement that's going on around the world now. Mm -hmm. uh, people are always going to be shifting and people from Fiji and indeed the whole of the Pacific uh, region have a ready um, s a supply of um, uh, workers. Yes. Um, so we've understood that it was going to be a challenge for us from, from the very get-go. Uh, we, we could see it happening immediately after uh, the borders reopened. What it has meant for the industry, it has had to rethink how it does its, um, its training. It's, yeah. it, it's taken it up as uh, part of what it just does generally, even though many of them aren't set up to do training. Right. And in this, um, you know, I, I have to say, we, we, we've seen that now the entire country has realized it, it, it is a, a challenge. Yes. Um, We've got public sector having um, suddenly realized, okay, we don't have enough people operating or within our services. Uh, you'd look at education with the teachers moving overseas, the nurses from the medical services moving overseas. Um, immigration, for instance, is short of over 40 people, and right. the people are wondering why the work permit um, process is taking so long. Well, they don't have enough staff. Right. Uh, and having to bring in new staff, it's a whole process of training that goes yes. on. So that's an experience that the industry is very, very um, used to right now, having be do uh, been doing it for the last over two years now. Yes. Um, I think it needs to be said that even though it's a challenge, you can also be looked at as an opportunity. Perhaps it's an opportunity uh, and to look at how we're doing our education. Right. The whole education system needs to be reviewed. There's a whole lot of discussions taking place in workshops and symposiums. Every one of those people says that it's a challenge. Yes. We all know it's a challenge. Right. I don't hear anybody saying what we're going to do about it, right. which is a little bit of a worry. 
And uh, I mean, think about it. If we are offering courses in higher education institutions in, in TVET places, if we're offering programs, we're offering courses that are still the same amount of time or in the same, the same curriculum that was 10 years ago, then something is wrong. Mm. Something is wrong. We've got mm. children these days and young people these days who are using digital uh, technology like nobody's business. Right. So their learning ability has to be a lot faster. Yes. Why does it still take three years to do a degree in some of these programs? Right. Why? Surely we can ramp up some of these training programs. Surely we can cut them down into smaller bite-sized pieces right. so that people within the industries like tourism, like manufacturing, like a whole lot of public sector areas can get people working a lot faster. Right. So I don't think we're, we're looking at the solutions as holistically as we probably should have. Right. I certainly don't see enough consultation within, um, uh, from the higher education um, uh, institutions with the uh, industries, right. and that should probably happen a little bit more. Yeah. What does a particular industry demand now that it didn't need before? Right. Um, and there's a whole lot of changes that have happened. Right. Does it need three years for somebody to, to get a particular program recognized? Right. You know, or, yeah. or, or can it be cut down uh, into mm. smaller bite-sized chunks? And I'm not saying break it down into diplomas because even those take quite, quite yes, long yeah, to yeah. do. Yeah. And if you take a look at the workforce right now, people within the workforce, I mean, just look within your office area yes. and ask how many people actually have a degree and why don't they? Mm. Because it's just become too hard right. or too boring to, fi uh, to finish mm. or you're not speaking <laughs> kind of language that I can understand anymore. Right. Put it yeah. on my on my um, on my gadget so I can you know uh, better read it for one thing. Yes. So I, th I think we're not quite in touch with what the younger people probably need to get them learning a lot faster. Right. Um, because we're so ingrained with how our educational system has been designed and built in since yes. the colonial fathers were here <coughs> right. so many hundreds of years ago. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the point is we, we need to make the change happen faster because change is happening within the industries and within economies a lot faster. Right. So perhaps we need to have a look at what is supporting these systems right. and what are the so possible solutions because the, the challenge can't be just looked at with the focus on, okay, it's a challenge. Yes, it's war on us. We, we, you know, we should all talk about this in huge talk fest. What are we going to do about no, it? Yeah. So it's, it's a thing with the industry. It's a, it's a very hard industry to break. Right. So they have to come up with solutions themselves. You know, um, ho uh, large hotel chains are looking at their own training program and bringing it in in a, di in a different way to the, the way they used to. Right. Smaller um, groups of people are getting together to say how they can share um, new ways of training so that they can get their people on site a lot better. We're bringing people in from overseas a lot more so that they can train uh, larger groups of people and share that, uh, share that knowledge and skills. Okay. Well, we'll uh, come back to the discussion after a short break. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back to the show. We're having a very, very interesting discussion with the head of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, Fantasia Lockington, about um, the pros and cons of the tourism industry. And we're now going to move into um, an area that uh, she recently wrote about in uh, Tourism Talano that appeared in the Fiji Times this week, um, and that's about room shortages. Uh, Fantasia, if you could just explain how many rooms we actually need and we're short, um, and also the issue of Airbnbs as well. Sure. So I think I should provide a little bit of context for yes. background so that people understand where it's all coming from. Um, so about 10 years ago, we, we have not seen, uh, let me go back. Uh, mm. 
if you look back a decade ago, there has not been a whole lot of development in, in tourism in terms of accommodation. Right. Um, no big resorts, small or otherwise, are being built. Uh, if they were, they've, they've, uh, you know, they're quite negligible in terms of the numbers. In the meantime, in the last 10 years, the support for the national uh, airline, Fiji Airways, has been um, really, really good. Right. so that they've been able to expand their fleet, um, you know, put on uh, better frequencies, uh, and, and make sure that their fleet of aircraft are, you know, uh, very efficient, um, steady that, and, and, and really new. Mm -hmm. a and uh, you, you do need to provide the National Airline that sort of support, because long, it, it requires long-term planning to, yes. to get to where you need to. Uh, and, and that's where they are. But in the meantime, um, people weren't thinking about even though we were reminding them that on the one hand you had a slowly increasing seat capacity um, but you weren't increasing your room inventory at right. the same time because they sh really should match yes. uh, otherwise where where are you going to take the people so we've got the situation now where we've got some say 3,000 some say 4,000 some say even 5,000 uh, more rooms are needed uh, when you compare the kind of seat capacity that the national airline now has. And yes. believe me, I really think Fiji should um, be really, really aware of how lucky we are mm -hmm. as a small Pacific Island country to have the kind of national airline that we do have. Right. Um, its size, its, um, its wonderful performance, you know, you, you can't go past it. But at the same time, we need to also consider that we have not got the room inventory that mm. the airline needs yes. to make sure that um, the number of people that it can bring in have somewhere to stay. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work going on in the background to have a look at um, uh, where the investment opportunities are uh, and how we can make that all uh, yeah. uh, happen a reality. And there's been a lot of work going on in the background in the last year or so. Um, so park that aside, I just wanted to put that in there for, for context. Yes. So what's happened is that when you've got this huge demand, you create a hole, somebody's going to find a way to fill it. And yes. Airbnb has come to that fore. And kudos to them. Mm. It, um, you know, it's part of what they call the new economy where you use already existing resources. You don't have to go in, you know, build new things. You've already got something available. And these little industries are created because you, you're using what you've got at hand. Mm. And Airbnb fits into this um, new economy model very, very well. Mm. So it's, it's providing some access, like around a thousand rooms are now available in Fiji. It's a humongous amount. Right. Uh, and probably many people don't realize how many we actually have available. But if you can't get a hotel room, that is your alternative. Yes. It's providing uh, obviously some some great uh, revenue for the ho uh, homeowners, which you know, and w and why not? But it does a couple of other things as well. Yes. That's probably not a good thing for a small economy like Fiji. Um, we're worrying about it on the uh, industry side because we're a very very regulated, heavily regulated industry. Yes. Um, this uh, 10 years ago, uh, right up to only a few years, in fact, um, the industry was the only industry paying 25% taxes, whereas everybody else was paying nine. Mm -hmm. um, it's also um, very, very aware uh, that it needs to be compliant because you're dealing with overseas visitors all the time. Right. You want to make sure that your safety requirements are mm -hmm. up there with the best. And we're competing with people around the world, so right. you have to make sure that you do it right. Mm -hmm. So not just safety, but you know, you're competing on every level in terms of your, 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 your rooms, your, the, the type of things that you want to be able to uh, offer right. that the visitor can find anywhere else around the world. You must match it, if not better it. So we've got all that regulations that are required as part of a compliant industry, something yes. that FHTA must uh, consistently remind our members to do. Uh, and share and uh, create awareness and even do training around it to make sure that everybody's uh, on board with it. And then you've got uh, Airbnb offering the 1,000 rooms with absolutely no regulations. Uh, and and you, Airbnb can say, look, we, you know, they have to abide by our requirements and standards. And that's all very well. But there's a whole lot of revenue 
probably going overseas because yes. the owners of those properties aren't necessarily here, right. even if they're local. Right. Um, and then you've got um, entire um, local councils who aren't getting any kind of, um, um, what do you call, uh, feed-in to the systems that everybody else is in terms of whether you're paying taxes or levies or fees for, right. you know, for, your, for your property. On top of that, our real concern, apart from it being not as regulated as uh, the, uh, the accommodation uh, providers are, is the fact that there's no accountability in terms of what happens if a visitor um, takes ill, falls down, or there's an accident of some sort. Yes. And what we found, uh, and so that people think, okay, you know what, Airbnb will take care of it, but as you and I know, if you happen to know the owner of the Airbnb and you go, hey bro, can I uh, uh, use, your, okay. use your place for, you know, next week and yes. can you give me mates rates? And you have a problem with it uh, because yeah. you don't think that he provided mm. you the kind of service or mm. somebody uh, mm. had a bad accident mm. uh, at the place while you were there. Mm. Where are you taking your issues to? And yes. usually they come to me yeah. or, or yeah. the Consumer Council or yeah. FCCC and the three of us go, well, yeah. you know, what, we're not what, sure. Yeah, what do we what do? do, do? do? This one falls through the cracks. Yeah. And it, it worries us because yeah. what if there's a really big issue? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and how are we going to see? Because no one's going to say, hey, you know, you need to remember that they were at an Airbnb and that's why that accident happened. No, all it is will be, and probably on the feature times for, the, uh, for that matter, yeah. that, oh, a visitor has been badly hurt. You know, right. what is the tourism industry doing in terms of safety? So that is always going to be our concern. Mm -hmm. And so we're just saying to, and, and we've had this conversation with uh, FRCS, we've had this conversation uh, with the Ministry of Tourism to say, Somebody needs to make sure that that gap is closed somewhere. Yes. Somebody needs to take uh, take it a little bit on board in terms of who is going to be the enforcing ag agency for whether you're going to consider regulating them, whether you're going to consider um, taxing them in some way. And look, we've had people come to us to say, we want to do the right thing. We want to open our place right. as an Airbnb. What are the licenses that we need to pay for? What do we need to do? Right. And there isn't anything that we can give to them. So we need that. So we need, we that. need that. So that th yes. th we're saying that there is a gap there. People want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but that that has not been made available. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's something that we have constantly said to the different agencies within the government to say that it is not often appreciated that the industry has you know moved at a lightning speed, yes. and the regulations and legislations and policies that um, that it must abide by have have not kept kept up with it right. there are new loopholes in the system mm. there are new players in the area uh, that that haven't been considered uh, and there are some very very outdated uh, legislation and regulations that don't even make sense anymore right. uh, that we would like um, them to review but um, I think all things in good time because they've already got lots of problems that yeah. they're sorting out right now uh, yeah. But yeah, we've we've put it on their radar to yeah. say that we think that you should you, you, you should sort this. You know, you mentioned um, tourist uh, safety. You know, we've had some incidents recently with uh, uh, tourism that was out uh, snorkeling or, or something, and uh, there's been other incidents. Uh, the child that got electrocuted. Yeah. What uh, what is the industry doing to ensure that Fiji remains as safe as possible? I had mentioned earlier, uh, Felix, that it's one of our key things in mm -hmm. terms of safety. Um, you know, just yesterday we took the time to go and say thank you to um, the policemen that were in our area near where our office is to say, hey, we see you, we appreciate that you're here because we can see, you right. know, the incidences of small crimes within the city area actually reducing and we really, really appreciate that. Um, we are always, always concerned that the number number one key item for Fiji should be that it is a safe destination, number yes. one. And then all the other things come off because it's natural. Mm. Um, so anything that picks up on our interest to say, okay, is that going to eventually fall apart and someone's gonna get hurt? We try and take it to whoever the regulator is or whoever the agency is to bring it to their attention to say, are you aware this is happening? I'd like to see it happen a little bit more often mm -hmm. and sometimes the coordination needs to happen a lot faster than it probably does, right. but it is very much there. 
I also want to say that in terms of those safety issues, for instance, snorkeling, mm. the resort might do all it, it can in terms of its regulations, training the people that are doing right. the right thing, having a cordoned off area and making sure that no one um, you know, snorkels out of the, these areas. Right. But we rely on other agencies doing their own support in terms of what they also need to do. Mm -hmm. So with, when it comes to maritime stuff, that's going to be MSEF. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have picked up quite often and notified them to say, mm -hmm that unless you monitor what's going on in the small communities that also mm. own their own boats, mm. are those people um, that are driving those boats licensed? Mm. Do they have the required number of life jackets on board in the same way that you really focus with a steely eye on how tourism operators are doing their stuff? Yes. You should also do the same thing with the, the community owned um, boats and the vessels that are being done. Right. So sometimes when we take a look at an incident that has happened, mm -hmm. we usually find that um, it is something beyond the control mm -hmm. of the also tourism good. operator. Right. And then <laughs> it's, it becomes a little bit awkward for us to go, okay, MSF, you didn't actually go and look at that. Right. Um, and it requires uh, a little bit more effort a lot, of, uh, a lot of the time for, because it's a larger space that they need to look at when you have a look at communities out there in the maritime areas who also have their own vessels because they go fishing because right. it's a transport uh, medium. Whereas if you focus just on the tourism industry, it's a lot easier because you just tick them off going, yeah, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there. But the yeah. communities, they're much bigger, they're right. much wider. And it's the wild, wild west out there. Yes. So maybe we need a message where everyone should be responsible. It should. The rules should be applicable to everybody everywhere. and not just tourism because you know that they will do what right. they're told and they don't like being non-compliant right. because they could stop their services. Yes. But that is not uh, passed on to the everyday people. If you and I had a vessel, would mm -hmm. they come down as hard on us? I doubt it. Right. Okay. Well, that's a very interesting uh, discussion with um, the head of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, Fantasia Lockington. We Thank you for coming on our show. It was my uh, pleasure. Yes, and thank you for the lovely Talanoa. A lot of positives, a lot of uh, information out there, maybe for the authorities to even look at in terms of the education um, sector and how to better prepare our children and our students for tourism, which is a big earner now. Uh, we're talking about $2 billion plus um, into the country. Um, Please visit our website www.fijitimes.com to watch this show and um, others like it and our social media platforms Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Um, thank you. <laughs>